Persons who belong to a minority group have many ways to adapt and live in a society where they are deemed undesired. They can remain within the confines of their community, leaving it only when necessary. They can assimilate and adopt the predominant culture with the hope of becoming accepted. They can develop an exaggerated sense of pride in their own culture, clinging to even antiquated customs. Regardless of the path chosen, the problem of living as a second-class citizen remains, and this feeling can be soul-crushing. People living in such conditions need leaders more than any other group. But where would such a leader come from? What experience would qualify him or her for this role? In such dark conditions, perhaps only pain can prepare one for the job. Losses in childhood, humiliation in school, crimes as a teenager, and suffering as a man. We all know that diamonds are created through pressure. Well, the trials and tribulations of this person made him a diamond amongst men. This is the story of Malcolm X. Malcolm Lillo was born in Omaha, Nebraska on May 19, 1925. He is the son of Earl Lillo and Louise Helen Northern Lillo. The couple had seven children together, in which Malcolm was the fourth. Both Earl and Louise were activists, teaching their children black pride and self-reliance. Malcolm's father was a local leader at the Universal Negro Improvement Association, an organization founded by black nationalist and pan-African activist Marcus Garvey, a man Malcolm's father deeply admired. Due to threats from the Ku Klux Klan, Malcolm and his family relocated to Lansing, Michigan, only to be harassed and have their house burned by the Black Legion, a terrorist sister organization of the KKK. When Malcolm was six, his father's body was found severed on streetcar tracks. Many believe this brutal murder was done by the Black Legion. The homicide, however, was dismissed by local authorities and labeled a suicide. This event was deeply disturbing to Malcolm and his mother. Six years later, Malcolm's mother was declared insane and committed to a state asylum. Malcolm was sent to a foster home and attended school. He excelled in junior high school and continued to perform well in high school until an incident occurred. One of his high school teachers asked Malcolm what career he wanted to get into. Malcolm responded that he had aspirations of becoming an attorney. The teacher was taken aback and then responded, That's not a realistic goal for a nigger. Malcolm was completely discouraged. He would later state that the white world offered no place for a career-oriented black man, regardless of talent. He dropped out of high school and began working a variety of small jobs while living with his half-sister in Boston. In 1943, Malcolm moved to New York City's Harlem, where he found employment at the New Haven Railroad. Having accepted the fact that mainstream had no place for him aside from subaltern jobs, he plunged himself into a life of crime. He operated under the criminal name of Detroit Red. He engaged in drug dealing, gambling, racketeering, robbery, and pimping. Malcolm pretty much became a statistic. When summoned by the local draft board for military service in World War II, he dodged active duty by rambling the following to the recruiter. I want to be sent down south, organize them nigger soldiers, steal us some guns, and kill us some crackers. He was declared mentally disqualified from military service. In late 1945, after the war, Malcolm returned to Boston, where he and four accomplices committed a series of burglaries targeting wealthy white families. This event led to his arrest in 1946, where he was given a 10-year sentence at Charleston State Prison. Malcolm was only 19 at the time. Two years later, he was transferred to Norfolk Prison Colony a place that would mark a turning point in Malcolm's life. At Norfolk Prison, Malcolm met a fellow convict named John Bembry, a self-educated prisoner he would develop total respect for. Bembry persuaded Malcolm to reform himself. Under his influence, Malcolm developed a voracious appetite for reading. He studied history, science, philosophy, psychology, and religion. He read books by Gandhi on a struggle in India. He read about the opium wars in China. He read about African colonization. Most importantly, he found pamphlets from the abolitionist anti-slavery society and read descriptions of the atrocities committed against the slaves. He would go on to say, 
I will never forget how shocked I was when I began reading about slavery's total horror. Book after book showed me how the white man had brought upon the world's black, brown, red, and yellow peoples every variety of suffering and exploitation. Around the time Malcolm was in prison, a relatively new religious movement claiming to be the true religion for black people was spreading. This movement was known as the Nation of Islam. I'd like to side note here and mention that the Nation of Islam represent a more extreme sect of Islam and is not a true reflection of the religion. Anyway, this movement would reach Malcolm to several of his siblings, but he initially rejected it. Malcolm was actually called Satan inside prison because of his detest for God. The idea of a just God letting one race be oppressed by another made no sense to him. Finally, Malcolm's brother Reginald paid him a visit in prison. He shared with Malcolm some of the teachings from the Nation of Islam, including the belief that white people are devils. As you can probably imagine, this idea found fertile soil in Malcolm's mind. In late 1948, Malcolm wrote to Elijah Muhammad, the leader of the Nation of Islam. Muhammad advised him to renounce his past, humbly bow in prayer to God, and abandon the last name given to him by white slave masters who owned his family. This conversion to the Nation of Islam is what pushed Malcolm to change his last name from Lilla to X. Thus, Malcolm X was born. After his release from prison in 1952, Malcolm X visited Elijah Muhammad in Chicago. He was made assistant minister at the nation's Temple No. 1 in Detroit. Later that same year, he established a temple in Boston. Two years later, he would again expand by establishing Temple No. 12 in Philadelphia. Two months later, he was selected to lead Temple No. 7 in Harlem. There, he rapidly expanded its memberships. Thanks to Malcolm's effort, the Nation of Islam grew from 400 members in 1952 to over 150,000 members by 1962. His admirers included celebrity Cassius Clay. Wait, who? Cassius Clay is the original name of boxer Muhammad Ali. He changed his name after becoming close friends with Malcolm X and dropped his slave name, Cassius Clay, and became Muhammad Ali. Malcolm was highly intelligent and an excellent speaker. He also had an impressive physical presence. He stood 6 feet 3 inches tall and was well built. He was well groomed and many described him as very handsome. This magnetic quality led him to quickly rise the ranks within the Nation of Islam, making him second in command only to Elijah Muhammad himself. But what was Malcolm X preaching? What were the philosophies that people still remember him for to this day? Let's have a look. Malcolm X believed that black men should look to themselves for solutions. He argued that the two major issues in the black community is first, the fraudulent education they received from public schools, and second, the moral perversion that black urban culture encourages. He preaches for black men and women to let go of vice, embrace industry, and honest trade with one another. This will then lead to self-respect and ultimately, autonomy and freedom. Malcolm X rejects the non-violent protest strategy of Dr. Martin Luther King. He believes that black people should protect themselves by any means necessary. He would famously make the statement that, we are non-violent with people who are non-violent with us. Having lost both of his parents and four uncles to white violence, Malcolm lost patience on relying on a law for security. He advocated black men to take protection into their own hands rather than wait for help from the police. Malcolm X and the Nation of Islam believed that African Americans must separate from white society rather than integrate. He argued that a form of reparation can be a 10% land allocation to African Americans only, where they can live and build their own infrastructure, police, and technical innovations. In other words, he wants a black civilization. Malcolm X's studies of Christianity while in prison led him to conclude that the religion subtly teaches his followers to detest anything that is dark. Black is the color of evil. He also points to the fact that Jesus is white, although he lived in a region where the odds of that are unlikely. 
He therefore advocates the more colorblind religion of Islam, whom he feels a black people's true religion. Malcolm concluded that every relationship he had with whites had been tainted with dishonesty, injustice, greed, and hatred. His historical studies have also shown him a string of overt and insidious crimes committed by whites to all people. He would preach this general mistrust of whites to his followers, along with ideas of black superiority. As Malcolm continued to gain prominence in 1955, he met a woman named Betty Sanders at one of his lectures. The two would marry three years later in 1958 and have six daughters together. Malcolm would continue gaining notoriety and spreading his influence. However, America during that time experienced racial tensions far beyond what we know today. This tension would inevitably arrive at Malcolm's doorstep. In 1961 came a violent confrontation between Nation of Islam members and LAPD. Police officers shot seven Muslims. One person was crippled, William X. Rogers, who was shot in the back and paralyzed for life. Another was murdered, Ronald Stokes, a Korean War veteran who was shot and killed from behind while raising his hands to surrender. Malcolm X had decided to retaliate with action. He rallied the more hardened nation of Islam members to take violent revenge against the police. This action, however, was blocked by Elijah Muhammad. This act created the beginning of the rift between Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X. The divide between the two would continue as Malcolm discovered that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad wasn't so honorable. He was sleeping with several of his teenage secretaries. Elijah Muhammad had 19 children, many of whom were out of wedlock. Malcolm blew the whistle on the scandal and this created a serious rivalry between the two. The final blow would come when President John F. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas in 1963. Malcolm was very unsympathetic and was warned by Elijah Muhammad not to speak on a subject. But when a reporter asked Malcolm his thoughts on a Kennedy assassination, his response was that chickens were coming home to roost. Malcolm was suspended for 90 days as a result. He would publicly announce his departure from the Nation of Islam three months later, on March 8, 1964. After leaving the Nation of Islam, Malcolm X founded Muslim Mosque Inc and the Organization of Afro-American Unity, a secular group that advocated pan-Africanism. On March 26, 1964, he briefly met with Martin Luther King Jr. in which the two had an odd moment together. The next month in April, Malcolm gave a speech titled The Ballot or the Bullet, which he advised African Americans to vote, essentially taking the MLK approach, but cautioned that if violence continued, black men should take up arms. Right after that speech, Malcolm flew to Saudi Arabia to begin a pilgrimage to Mecca. This experience would change him forever as we will see. In Mecca, something interesting happened. Malcolm experienced genuine kindness and hospitality from numerous white men. These were white Muslims, but they were still white men nonetheless. This not only made Malcolm less judgmental towards whites, but it forced him to finally acknowledge the many white men and women who fought and suffered for black civil rights. He stopped making blanket statements accusing the white man as the devil. He also learned, after dining with a white Muslim scholar, that whenever there was an issue regarding color in the Middle East, it was almost always a result of Western influence. In his autobiography, Malcolm stated, The true Islam has shown me that a blanket indictment of all white people is as wrong as when whites make blanket indictments against blacks. I think we can all say amen to that. Malcolm returned to the United States and continued addressing a wide variety of audiences. However, his conflict with the Nation of Islam intensified and he was repeatedly threatened. Malcolm would make the following observation. In any city, wherever I go, making speeches, holding meetings of my organization, or attending business, black men are watching every move I make, awaiting their chance to kill me. On February 14, 1965, a Molotov cocktail was thrown at Malcolm's house, in effect burning it down. No one got hurt by the incident, but Malcolm knew the threat was very real at this point. One week later, February 21, 1965, Malcolm X was giving a speech before a crowd at a ballroom in New York City. Suddenly, 
A person in the audience shouted, Nigger, get your hand out of my pocket. What came next was a man rushing forward, shooting Malcolm X in the chest with a sawed-off shotgun. Two other men charged the stage, also firing at Malcolm with semi-automatic handguns. Malcolm X was pronounced dead at 3.30 p.m. The autopsy identified 21 gunshot wounds to the chest, left shoulder, arm, and legs. One gunman, Talmadge Hire, was nearly beaten to death by the audience before police arrived. Witnesses identified the other two gunmen as Norman 3X Butler and Thomas 15X Johnson. All three men were convicted for murder and sentenced to life in prison. The ballroom where Malcolm was assassinated can still be visited today. Those of you who want to pay your respects to the great man can save this location on a Cityscape app. What is the definition of freedom, justice, and equality for the black man, and where and when is it to be attained? Well, take equality first. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad doesn't teach us to uh, associate equality with whites. Equality has nothing to do with whites. We, want e we don't want to be equal with the white man. He's not the criteria or yardstick by which equality is measured. He's not in a position to tell us we are equal. It's not his right, it's not his to do. Equality, we want equality. We had equality before the white man was created. We had, the, we had equality before the white man came into existence. And we want equality whether the white man is on this earth or not. Equality means the uh, opportunity to develop all of our dormant potential, all, all of our dormant capability. And, and, and uh, in developing this dormant uh, capability, the right and the ability to stand on this earth on some land uh, of our own and bring about a civilization and a society in, we will, in which we will be completely independent, complete freedom to uh, uh, take care of the needs, to take care of the uh, wants and the likes and the dislikes of our people, to establish our own nation, our own society, our own heaven, our own future. This is what we mean by freedom, by uh, equality, and justice means uh, as you sow, so shall you reap. If you do wrong, you'll get wrong in return. And if you do right, you'll get right in return. When you're in your own nation, in your own land, you're in a position to get justice. But when you're in another man's country, in another man's land, under another man's flag, and under another man's uh, 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 government, and under another man's court system, you have to look to that other man for justice, and you'll never get it. Never get it. So who killed Malcolm X? There has been many speculation as to who was behind the assassination. Some people believe it was the FBI. They have been keeping Malcolm under surveillance since his time in prison, after he wrote a letter to President Truman declaring himself a communist. Another group of people believe it was the CIA, who also kept a watch on Malcolm due to his funding from the government of Egypt and his meeting with Fidel Castro in 1960. Others even blame NYPD for some reason. The most widely adopted belief, however, is that the Nation of Islam is related to the assassination, although Elijah Muhammad and his protege Louis Farrakhan deny the allegation. I guess we will never know. Malcolm's public funeral was attended by over 10,000 mourners. His body may have died, but his spirit is still with us today. I am not a proponent of ethnic states, so I do not agree with Malcolm's ideas of black separatism. However, I do believe that his encouragement of pride and self-reliance is a necessary step for every community. Pride should not come from vain ideas about appearance or identity, but by mastering skills and living with integrity. Do not respond to hate with hate. Just improve yourself instead. As you improve, you cultivate self-love. As you increasingly love yourself, the opinions of others matter less. This is exactly what Malcolm X did. He not only reformed himself in prison, but he never stopped learning throughout his journey as a minister and political leader. He continuously updated his viewpoint. We see this when he finally endorses Martin Luther King by encouraging black men and women to vote. And we also see this when he dropped the idea that all whites are devils after his visit to Mecca. 
Malcolm X improved himself so much that his self-image became above the opinion of others. And this is where true freedom lies, being above the opinion of others. See you next time. What's going on guys, this is James Allen. I hope you enjoyed watching the Malcolm X episode as much as I enjoyed making it. Uh, one thing I want to mention that is, um, as a millennial, and a lot of you watching this are Generation Z, according to YouTube, I think us young people, we tend to forget that an entire generation before us literally put their bodies on the line so that we could have this multiracial society that we enjoy today. I think we've sort of taken diversity for granted because we're so used to it that we sometimes forget that not too long ago that didn't exist. So that's one thing I want to mention. Basically, us pay our respect to the generation before us, which Malcolm X was part of. Now, before we end this episode, there's one thing I'd like to address. Be obvious clearly. That is, my name is James Allen, and as you could tell, this is a slave master's name. So I was wondering of changing my name to Lumumba Shakur Abdul. What do you guys think? Ha, 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 ha.